When we think about our beautiful islands, we're probably thinking about specific scenery, places or wildlife, but there are other unique aspects of the Falklands. Take, for example, the cathedral stained glass windows spanning over a hundred years of history. Not only are they colourful reminders of the past, but they tell a story of pioneering life, those in peril on the sea, dedicated service to the community, and those who fought for the island's right to stay British. The Great East Window was placed there in memory of the first Bishop of the Falkland Islands, Waite Ockin Sterling, who began life as a missionary in Tierra del Fuego. The name of the diocese was a bit of a misnomer, as the bishop and most of the clergy worked mainly in South America, and the diocesan crest, which can be seen under the feet of Christ the King, is the Red Cross of St George over a map of South America. At the time, it was traditional to build a cathedral on British soil, and that's why it's in Stanley. Because the bishop was a great sailor, it's appropriate that St Nicholas features to the right of Christ the King. Patron saint of sailors, St Nicholas is holding a model of the bishop's yawl, the messenger, while underneath there's a fine etched panel of the three-masted schooner Alan Gardner rounding Cape Horn. The first ever Christian bishop, St Peter, stands to the left of Christ, and in the border there is a small picture of Bishop Stirling's hut in Tierra del Fuego. St Peter features again, together with St Andrew, in the double window dedicated to John Bonner of Port Sussex, who died in 1891, exactly a month after the tragic death from pneumonia of his son Harry, aged only 22. One of the early settlers, John had a license to kill wild bulls and settled at Port Sussex, where he ran a very successful farming enterprise. The window on the south wall next to the chancel screen was given by Mrs John Bonner in 1899 and recalls the commissioning of the disciples by Jesus, who's seen in the act of blessing them and saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It's another reminder of the missionary origins of both the diocese, once the largest in the whole Church of England, and the cathedral itself. Opposite, on the north wall, there is the poignant memorial to Charles Hansen, another early pioneer lost at sea in 1891. It is I. Be not afraid, says Jesus, as he walks across the water to the fearful disciples, afraid that their boat would be swamped in the turbulent waters of the Sea of Galilee. Hansen was returning to the islands from Patagonia on his schooner Result when he was swept overboard in a storm. The second double window on the south side of the nave dates from the 1950s and reflects the more vibrant stained glass work of the mid 20th century. Christ features in both windows as shepherd of the sheep on the left hand side and friend of the children on the right. There shall be one fold and one shepherd, reads one of the inscriptions, while the other reminds us that he took them up in his arms and blessed them. Both windows were given in memory of the Bonner family, this time John's son George of San Carlos, his wife Frances Anne and their children. No account of the cathedral's windows would be complete without mentioning Mary Eleanor Watson, the redoubtable district nurse who devoted her entire life to looking after the community of Stanley, and in so doing became something of a legend. Her bicycle features in the window and is an object of endless fascination to the tourists who look around. She died in 1958 and the window itself dates from 1960. It's freer in style, more colourful and reflects the growing confidence of the Western world. Mary's cottage and the apocryphal story of Tobias and his dog with the Archangel Raphael, patron of doctors, nurses and travellers, completes this particular story in glass. The most recent addition to the art collection in the cathedral is the post-liberation window, 
dedicated in 1988 in memory of those who lost their lives during and after the conflict. At the centre of the window is the Falklands Crest and the motto Desire the Right, whilst below can be seen the crests of the Royal Navy, the Army, the RAF, the Merchant Navy, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and the Royal Marines. Underneath the crests are pictures of the Cathedral and Whalebone Arch, symbolising Stanley, a typical camp settlement, and to the right the mountains of South Georgia and Gritlikan Church. Finally, to complete this tour, the west window was given in memory of a great local benefactor, George Markham Dean. It shows Jesus as both Good Shepherd and King. After the inspirational, colourful windows in the cathedral, we turn to the equally eloquent musical sentiments of our first hymn. Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken was written by John Newton, the former slave ship captain who went on to become a priest in the Church of England and a prolific writer of uplifting hymns like Amazing Grace. Newton had an extraordinary upbringing. His devout mother died when he was seven, and four years later he joined his father in the Navy. The young Newton became reckless and licentious, and was later flogged for attempted desertion. He managed to escape after being captured by a West African slave trader, only to become captain of a slave ship himself. After a real conversion experience during a violent storm at sea, he became an active Christian, eventually giving up the slave trade. After leaving the sea, he was appointed tide surveyor in Liverpool, where he came under the influence of the Wesleys, who persuaded him to begin training for the ministry. At the same time, he joined forces with William Wilberforce and worked hard for the complete abolition of slavery. Born in London in 1725, John Newton had been brought up by his mother with a comprehensive knowledge of the Bible and an inquiring mind. Despite a rudimentary education, he went on to learn Greek and Hebrew and is said to have read Euclid whilst in captivity and drawn geometrical diagrams in the African sand. Based on Psalm 87 and the book of Isaiah, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken is one of his great hymns of praise, first published in 1779, together with 279 other compositions. The hymn was to become a great favourite of another action man almost a hundred years later, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, who would wake up his men by singing it loudly in the early morning. The words are on the screen for you to follow or join in.
We cast our burdens upon you, O Lord, and you, you will sustain us. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and, and renew a right spirit within us. us. Cast us not away from your presence, and, and take, take not your Holy Spirit, Spirit from, from us. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and, and sustain, sustain us with your bountiful Spirit. Blessed are you, O Lord, day by day, the God, the God of, of our, our salvation, salvation, who bears our burdens. O Lord, open our lips, and our, our mouth shall, shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love, according to your judgment, give us life. As we rejoice in the gift of a new day, we can't do much better than reflect in the words of our next hymn that, come what may, Christ is our cornerstone. They are words that have stood the test of time. Their author, John Chandler, was not an original writer, but a highly successful translator of medieval and early Latin hymns. Born in Surrey in 1806, Chandler followed his father into the priesthood, succeeding him as Vicar of Whitley in 1837. He was the author of several academic works and published a hundred translations of early hymns in The Hymns of the Primitive Church in 1837. In the preface to this work, which included such well-known hymns as Conquering Kings Their Titles Take, O Happy Day and on Jordan's bank the Baptist cry, Chandler said that he had been motivated by a lack of suitable hymns to accompany the traditional and ancient prayers of the Anglican liturgy. Accordingly, he worked with continental medieval sources and the Parisian breviary of 1736 to produce a series of what he called ancient, simple, striking and devotional hymns in a word, in every way, likely to answer our purpose. When Christ is our cornerstone, together with five other translations, found their way into the first edition of Hymns Ancient and Modern in the 1860s, Chandler's success was assured. The words of this classic hymn are on the screen, and you are welcome to join in at home if you would like to.
It's almost the halfway point on our Lent journey and we should by now have become aware of the reality of God's loving care towards us. Standards and boundaries are laid out in today's first reading from Exodus, but they're not intended to cramp our style, merely provide a practical framework for how we act on the command of Jesus to love our neighbour, and in turn show our own love for the God who loved us first. After heaping praise on the God of creation, Psalm 19 goes on to point out that he loves us enough to forgive us, even when we repeatedly make mistakes. What all this is building up to, however, are the words of Jesus in the reading from the Gospel of John. Jerusalem was the centre of the Jewish world, and like so many other men, Jesus had made a pilgrimage to celebrate Passover. It's little wonder that he was horrified at all the commercial and dubious activity going on inside the temple, seeking instead to return it to the worship of God. Jesus simply refuses to stand back or look the other way, and neither should we. All of this provides the opportunity for us to reassess what is important in our lives and the way in which we live out our faith. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 19, beginning to read at verse 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the ends of them, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring for ever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent and do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Lord Almighty and God of our ancestors, you who made heaven and earth in all their glory, all things tremble with awe at your presence before your great and mighty power. Immeasurable and unsearchable is your promised mercy. For you are God most high. You are full of compassion, long-suffering and very merciful, and you relent at human suffering. O God, according to your great goodness, you have promised forgiveness 
for repentance to those who have sinned against you. The sins I have committed against you are more in number than the sands of the sea. I am not worthy to look up to the height of heaven because of the multitude of my iniquities. And now I bend the knee of my heart before you, imploring your kindness upon me. I have sinned, O God, I have sinned, and I acknowledge my transgressions. Unworthy as I am, you will save me according to your great mercy. For all the host of heaven sings your praise, and your glory is for ever and ever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be for ever. Amen. Full of compassion and mercy and love is God the Most High, the Almighty. The first reading is taken from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning at verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honour your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Word of God was also uppermost in the mind of John Marriott when he wrote our next hymn, Thou Whose Almighty Word. Born in 1780, Marriott became only the second person in England to gain honours by public examination at Oxford in 1802. His published works included several volumes of sermons and a number of hymns, although most appeared after his death. One exception was Thou Whose Almighty Word, which first appeared in print in 1816, three years after its composition. It quickly became popular with the growing evangelical movement and was widely sung, particularly after being selected for inclusion in the new hymns Ancient and Modern. As, As a minor a poet, Marriott achieved some recognition, 
being befriended by Sir Walter Scott whilst tutor to the son of the Duke of Buccleuch at Dalkeith Palace. Not only did that friendship last, but the Duke ensured an income for life by presenting him to the rectory of Church Lawford in Warwickshire. In an age when you could hold more than one post at a time, he opted to take additional curacies and lived near Exeter, where the climate was much better for his wife's health. With its constant refrain of let there be light, the hymn echoes God's word in the book of Genesis and encompasses creation, the work of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. All of this is summed up in the final stanza when we ask that the wisdom of the Father, the love of the Son and the might of the Spirit might be a light that will spread across the face of the earth as boundless as the ocean's tide rolling in fullest pride. The words of this traditional hymn are on the screen now. second reading is written in the second chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, God in, in you I trust. You are the God of my salvation. To, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I hope all the day long. O oh my, oh my God, God in, in you I trust. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. To, to you, O Lord, Lord, I lift up my soul. soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. And we say the Benedictus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight, all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the, ter in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The Gospels are full of stories of Jesus' works of compassion and healing and about his patient suffering. So it comes as quite a shock to hear about him acting angrily and even violently, brandishing a whip and throwing furniture around. It looks as though he's suffering from a sudden and uncharacteristic fit of temper. What was going on here at the temple? Did Jesus upset the bankers' tables because he was incensed by the huge profits they were cheating out of their customers? Did he suddenly get mad about the noise and mess the sacrificial animals were making in a sacred space? At first reading, it certainly seems that way. But look a little more closely and you'll realise that this wasn't actually a case of Jesus suddenly losing his rag. When he went into the temple, he saw the animal sellers and the money changers. But then, John says, Jesus made a whip of cords. That is, he didn't just pick up an instrument which was at hand. He took the time to not a bunch of cords to create a whip. He deliberately planned and prepared to drive the dealers out of the temple. This wasn't sudden furious violence. Jesus was staging a dramatic demonstration, undertaking a deliberate prophetic action, making a point. So let's spend a few moments and put his actions into context. The temple in Jerusalem was the house of God. Jews recognised that God was too big, too great to live in house, any house made by human hands. But when Solomon built the first temple and dedicated it, the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord the sign of God's presence with his people. 
For the Jews, the temple was the place where they came to pray and to come close to God. Of all places, this was the most special and holy place where God made himself present to his people. And Passover was the most special time when the Jews came to the temple to make sacrifice and to remember and worship God as the Redeemer who had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. Now, just before this special time of Passover, Jesus arrives in the temple. He deliberately makes himself a whip of cords and drives out the merchants who provide the sacrifices, drives out the sacrificial cattle and sheep and orders the dove sellers to get their birds out of the temple. Now remember, sacrifice is one of the main purposes of the temple. It's through sacrifice that God forgives the sins of his people and renews his relationship with them. So what happens if there are no animals for sacrifice? How can sins be forgiven? How can people be brought back into relationship with God? What the people there in the temple that day didn't realize or understand was that Jesus was offering himself as the complete and perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now that Jesus had come, there was no need for animal sacrifice. The doves and the sheep and the cattle no longer had any place in the temple. The dramatic action climaxes with, with Jesus' words, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Not God's house or the Lord's house, but my father's house. A son has the right to give orders in his father's house. Jesus claimed the authority to do what he was doing because he was the son of God. But the people around him couldn't see this. Where's your authority, they asked. What proof can you give us that you've got the right to do this? Jesus gives them a cryptic answer. Tear down this temple and in three days I will build it again. Well, that reveals everything and it reveals nothing. The Jews think he's talking about the great building that they're standing in. It has taken 46 years to build so far and it's still under construction. How could anyone rebuild it in just three days? It's plain crazy. But Jesus isn't talking about wood and stone. He's talking about himself. He, Jesus, is the true temple and God is present in him. Wherever Jesus is, God is there among his people. The temple in Jerusalem could be destroyed. In fact, some 40 years later, it was destroyed and the whole practice of animal sacrifice came to an end. But Jesus is a temple that cannot be destroyed. Just three days after his sacrificial death on the cross, his body was raised up. Jesus lives with us by his spirit now and always. In the vision of Jerusalem that John describes in the book of Revelation, he says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no longer any need for a temple building with a system of animal sacrifice because Jesus Christ himself is both the temple, the place, the person where we come close to God and also the final perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Amen. As we continue on our Lent journey, let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing.
Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Amen. Our next hymn is a paraphrase of Psalm 34, which continues to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Through all the changing scenes of life resulted from the inspired partnership of Nahum Tate and Nicholas Brady, and was first published in 1696 in a new version of the Psalms of David. Although Tate and Brady worked together on the new Psalter, this particular hymn is generally credited to Tate, who had a particular gift for poetry and had been made Poet Laureate four years before. Born in Dublin in 1652, he came to London and spent several years writing plays, adapting Shakespeare and translating Latin and French texts for publishers, including a graphic treatise on syphilis entitled a poetic history of the French disease. His best known work is probably the libretto for Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas. The story has a sad sequel, however, as Tate turned to drink and died in a debtor's jail near the Royal Mint. When the original, much longer version of Through All the Changing Scenes of Life was shortened, and standardised for hymns ancient and modern in 1861, it became deservedly popular throughout the English-speaking world. The words are on the screen now for you to follow or join in.
With confidence and trust, let us pray to the God of the prodigal, saying, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, God, God of, of mercy, mercy, hear our prayer. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, God, God of, of mercy, mercy Hear our prayer. For those who are guiding our island at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. God, God of, of mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For all who we have injured or offended, God of mercy, hear our prayer. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let us pray for grace to keep Lent faithfully. Lord, we beseech you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and, and the, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God, our Redeemer, show us compassion and love. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.